Shalom to Education Minister, Minister of Diaspora Affairs, Naftali Bennett. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, great to be here. And before we begin, I, I want to thank uh, Uzi uh, Baruch. I want to thank uh, Dudu Sada, all the friends from uh, Arut Sheva, Sheva. Uh, and uh, Pete and Jennifer that came over from uh, the States. So I thought until about a minute and a half ago that Pete is a nice uh, broadcaster, which he probably he is, but it turns out that uh, this guy uh, is a major uh, in the, the 101st Airborne. That's Airborne is Tzadchanim, paratroopers. Uh, the 101st is the unit that I believe Band of Brothers was was done about them, so, and he served uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, I, I can only say that anyone who goes out and is willing to fight and uh, risk his life to defend his country, his nation, is a person who deserves uh, our respect. So, thanks. And so, round of applause. <laughs> so, really, Minister Bennett, let's begin with security. And we'll talk about the South. You know, there's the assessment that it's not worth it for the enemy to cause problems. It's not worth it for them to go into a conflict. And then we see the incidents that we saw a weekend. We see incidents throughout the year, there are incidents. Of course, there were mainly significant this weekend. How can we, how are we supposed to relate to the situation in the South? Again, contain, contain, contain. The first step is to understand the big picture. What, what we're doing, the, the, the incorrect way to go about it is to look at every event uh, in isolation. The big picture is there's this big octopus. The head of the octopus is located in Tehran. They're sending out their arms to, um, to flank us. So they have an arm, an Iranian arm, located in Lebanon, and it's called Hezbollah. They have an arm in Syria, which is called uh, uh, the Shiite militias. By the way, they're typically Pakistanians and Afghans. They have another arm in Gaza, which is called Hamas. Uh, their approach is they're willing to fight to the very last drop of blood of others. Iranians are not very uh, um, generous about their own lives, they're very happy to volunteer other people's lives. So that's the big picture. Now, for the past three decades, we have been fighting the arms, yet uh, giving immunity to the very head of the octopus. So we've been uh, fighting in Lebanon. I, I spent uh, decades in Lebanon behind enemy lines. We've lost boys in uh, Aita Shab, in Marun Aras. Back then, did anyone mention Iran? Was that even an issue? I was a soldier then. I was a captain, so I, you know, I didn't see the big picture. I was fighting the folks. They told me, you know, they said, go kill these guys. So we did that. But, uh, um, and in Gaza, we've lost boys in Sajaiya, and we've been shedding blood against those arms, but not touching the head. And the head is, is Tehran. Now, once you understand that analysis, you understand the folly of wasting all our efforts on the messenger and not touching the sender, the, the, the guy who's sending the, uh, these messengers. The approach I've been promoting, and I, I've seen that, I saw yesterday that the Prime Minister uh, explicitly adopted it in, in Munich, is we have to wage an ongoing uh, campaign, uh, diplomatic, economic, uh, intelligence, and other means campaign against the head of the octopus. One very good analogy is the Cold War. The United States made the, 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 the profound mistake was to go fight every, you know, in Vietnam they got stuck in, in, in the mess. Um, but when did they beat? the, the uh, Soviet Union, when they waged the Cold War, the Star Wars, and, and they uh, brought uh, uh, the Soviet Union to, to, to become broke by, by outspending them. They, they analyzed that that's their unique advantage. So we have to be smart and, and not just run in to fight 
uh, at the end, uh, you know, the, the Hezbollah and Hamas in direct, we have to be indirect approach. You mentioned the, the world, you mentioned the, the Prime Minister's statement. You know, I saw that the, the international media were, were surprised. They, they were saying, what a message, what a strong message. It seems that the world is a bit mixed up, and especially because of ISIS. They don't know who the good guys and the bad guys are, because Iran are against ISIS. The world is a bit mixed up. I'll, I'll simplify it. Both are bad guys. ISIS is the Sunni bad guys and Iran is the Shia bad guys. But the big difference between them is ISIS is an idea, it's a phenomenon. Uh, it's going to be around for a while. We never viewed ISIS as an um, existential threat and even not as a strategic threat. We viewed it as a threat. And fortunately the West has dealt with it, which is good. But you don't uh, uh, pull out ISIS to get Iran in. And what Iran, Iran's strategy is to create an ongoing corridor from Tehran through Baghdad, through Syria, Lebanon, the Mediterranean. We have to sever that corridor. And that's what we're doing. We're fighting back. We said some, something very simple. We will not allow Iran to establish itself in Syria and we're meeting our deeds. Tactically speaking, how do you prevent the sirens in the south? You know, the residents are starting to remember days ago. By being um, strong and using our force intelligently but forcefully and also understanding that each front is not isolated. Everyone's looking at us. Do these guys mean business? Are they willing to put their money where their mouth is? Are they willing to hit back? And would we fight back in Syria? Hamas looks at that. So what, the the F-16s that we heard flying over on Shabbat, that was a, an important uh, message? Yes, not enough. We, uh, we have to be... The way to avert war, war is not inevitable. We can avert war. The paradox is we can avert war only if we're very forceful up front, at the beginning. So how do you create uh, um, um, fear of war on the other side? When someone pushes you, you don't push him back. You have to be much more forceful, about 10 times more forceful than the initial hit. Um, I, I'm not going to get into the... No, but there isn't a deterrence for we don't want the area to be, uh, you know, go into war, go into conflict again? Well, of course we don't want war. War is a bad thing. I lost my best friend in the Second Lebanon War. Emmanuel Moreno is a horrible thought. War is a horrible thing, and, and I've been there and I've seen it, and it's terrible. No one wants war, but the way to avert war is to deter your enemy, and you have to... Uh, act in extraordinary measures and not in a linear graph but in a step graph so they need to understand that if they mess with us it will be very bad for them and this doctrine is something that uh, we've been promoting and I think it's not the official doctrine yet but from my experience over the next few months it will gradually be adopted by the, the world adopted you know here's the thing about the world the world's busy. Everyone's got stuff on their plate. We, in Israel, um, we have this misconception of the world. We think that the world goes around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Not many people really care about it. America's got its own issues. Uh, the UK is busy with the Brexit. Uh, Germany's busy with its own coalitions. Everyone's got problems. We are not the center of the world, but we have this obsession uh, to, to go around the world and, and invite them to our problems. And you always hear Israeli politicians go, we cannot have a future if we don't uh, have a two-state solution. And they roam around from one uh, capital to another, and people frankly couldn't care about, care less about it. We need to do what's right for Israel. We need to continue to export uh, technology, uh, intelligence. Let me tell you this. Israel is saving lives almost every week by letting other states know, hey, there's a specific terror attack on this street 
on this number of, of, of the apartment, go forward it in, in Europe. We're saving lives all around the world because we're smack in the middle of the biggest mess on, on the globe right now. We have two borders with ISIS. We have two borders directly where we're uh, hundreds of meters away from ISIS in the Sinai and in the gold, southern part of the Golan Heights. So no one knows ISIS better than us. And that's why we get all this intelligence. The, we have a lot to give the world, a lot to take from the world. We have to stop asking ourselves, what world will the world do? The world will respect us if we respect our ourselves, our sovereignty, and our uh, self-defense. Let's move from the borders. Let's move from the borders to inside of Israel, the Palestinian terror. We, thank God, are not experiencing the days of terror that we experienced really years ago, a year ago. Uh, but really, what should be the response? And should the response be the release of bodies of terrorists and transferring them to the enemy? No, uh, we had a, a big debate uh, within the, the cabinet. Uh, I led the, those who opposed and voted against the notion of uh, handing over terror bodies to terrorist bodies to, to the families. They don't deserve it. If you go out and murder Jews, there's no reason we should give you a, as a gift, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a funeral and, and uh, uh, any place. The funeral to, also becomes sometimes yeah. a ceremonial. Right. And, and by the way, until about a decade ago, we, we, we would bury them in Israel in a secret uh, location. And then once every decade or so, there, there'd be a deal and we'd hand over the bodies and get... I, I don't get this. So I, I'm, I'm going to um, exercise all my abilities to stop. This is a folly. Uh, it doesn't make sense. We get all these uh, mumbo-jumbo uh, legal reasons. The last one, what, the latest one was uh, that those bodies have inherent dignity, kvod adam, and they deserve to be buried. I, I don't think a terrorist who goes out and murders Jews has any rights to anything, period. Especially that Israeli bodies That's correct. are by them. That's correct. So uh, here there's two schools of thought. Uh, I'm leading the school of thought within the cabinet. Unfortunately, until now I've not managed to persuade, but you know me, we're not gonna give up. We're talking today about U.S.-Israel relations, and there were statements in the beginning by you, really, really uh, festive uh, statements. Were those statements correct? Are we in a totally different era? First of all, we are. Um, we have a very uh, supportive um, uh, administration in the U.S., certainly uh, profoundly different from the previous one, but, I'll tell you this, there's a, a very famous joke um, where there's this guy that goes every, listen to this, you gotta hear this story. Every, every week this guy goes to the Western Wall and he prays to God, let me win the lottery, every week. So one week after another, one year after another, 40 years, finally the angels go to God and say, come on God. Let him give him the, the lottery. And then God says, yeah, but he's got to buy a ticket. And, and my point here, my point here is we have to buy the ticket. We cannot expect Donald Trump to be uh, more hawkish than to us. To build up his heart. That's correct. Now, not everything is, sometimes you just move ahead, you do what's right. There's one direction, and that direction is Israeli sovereignty over the Israeli-controlled areas of Judea and Samaria. There's no difference between... In coordination with the U.S. administration? As much as possible, but not as a necessary element. We have to do what's right for Israel. Folks, it's been 51 years since we've held these uh, areas. 51 years! Jerusalem, Ariel, Malé Dumim, Ofra, Betel. This was always Jewish. 3,000 years ago was Jewish. It was never Palestinian. Show me the Palestinian flag, show me the Palestinian anthem, show me the Palestinian village from 100 years ago. The nationality of, of the Palestinian nationality is a startup from about 40 or 50 years ago. This is all new. We respect our Palestinian neighbors. We respect their uh, right for dignity. 
They can vote for their own parliament, have their own flag, pay their own taxes, run their own education. I, I don't want to run them. I want to separate. They'll have their autonomy. We'll, have, we'll apply Israeli law on Area C. And that's the direction, but we cannot expect President Trump to do it. We have to do the work. Thank you very much. Education Minister, Minister of Diaspora Affairs, Naftali Bennett, thank you very much. Thank you.